Good morning. It's great to be in a place where people are talking to one another before the service. It's, it's, a, it's just a positive, it's a good thing. that you, you like each other, or at least enough to have a conversation anyway. Um, let me just do a little bit of housekeeping before we begin our service properly. So today is the last day to vote for the new church committee. So we've done the process for a long time, but you, you do need to vote today if you want your vote to be counted. Um, and the voting papers need to be with myself or Derek by um, the end of the evening service, or the end of either Pre or Alpha. I'm checking with Derek, he's nodding, so that's okay, we'll do that. Um, so you can't drop them in later on tonight. So really, uh, half past seven tonight is when the voting papers are in. The, the most straightforward thing to do is to grab a pen at the end of the service and to vote this morning. Um, that's the easiest way to do that. Um, that'll be the final week, and then elders will, will count, count the votes um, for that. Um, on Tuesday, we are continuing with um, just a time for free tea and coffee and mosaic. Um, increasingly more coming each week. It's just an opportunity to get together um, through the winter months, and so you're very welcome. You're welcome to bring friends and others, others um, to join us on, on Tuesday morning between 10 and 12, just a mosaic, and come in through the red door. And this evening, Alpha continues. So Alpha began last week, and this week is the first week proper. So really, this week, we're looking at who is Jesus. Very simple. Um, in its title, but I just want to invite anyone who at this stage is thinking, I am a little bit unsure. I could do with looking at this afresh. Or maybe you have a friend, a family, a neighbor, um, somebody you're thinking this would be a great thing for them to, to hear. Um, so we'll show a video really for about 20 minutes and then just chat about it um, after that over some tea and coffee. Um, so we'd love you to come to that. Um, yeah, in Mosaic at half past six and the prayer meeting will be in the Bernie room at the same time. Halls, we discussed this last week, and so we will be closing our halls from next Monday morning, technically, but the last day will be next Sunday. Um, and so the Dunlop, McKinley, Minor Hall and Kitchen, really everything at the side of the corridor will be out of bounds for six weeks. Um, and if they're open, and they're allowed to be open, Sue will tell you if they're open, but otherwise uh, they are out of bounds to everybody, um, as specialist licensed contractors take all the asbestos out of that side of the church. Um, you'll notice there's no chairs in the, in the choir box. There'll be other things put in other places. We have too much stuff and not enough space. So you may turn up and go, why are there boxes up the side of this room? You just need to trust there was nowhere else for them to go. Um, people are playing a version of Jenga, trying to fit things in in different places. So we are just asking that you're generous with that. You're just generous. If it's, if it's not dangerous and it's just inconvenient, we're all just taking a little bit of a hit to that. I think the minister's room is about to be stacked with things. Uh, everything will just be put in places that they'll have to do for six weeks. Um, so do bear that in mind. We think we've managed to get all groups in with lots of adaptations um, into the building in different places. But just be sensitive to that. If you arrive and there's something else already on, it's just an honest mistake. We think we've covered most things. Um, so we're just asking for generosity around that. And in advance notice, Kirk's session has been moved to the 21st of February. Um, committee will only meet if necessary, so hopefully committee won't meet. And that's uh, The plan is committee don't need to meet in February, um, but session will meet on the 21st. And the last um, uh, is more of an awareness thing. So the church has bought an automated defibrillator. I can't say this word. I've bluffed it in every committee meeting I've been in because I can't say it. Defibrillator. I can't say it. It's, it sounds close, doesn't it? I don't even know. Uh, uh, so we have bought one and it'll be put up in the hall. Um, and so this week and next week we'll, we'll announce that we now have it. Um, but there's a short sort of four minute training video that we'll either show actually at the end of the service next week so you've seen it. Um, or we'll show it in the Bernie room. We'll, we'll, we'll let you know about that. Because it, having it and not knowing where it is or how to use it means you might as well not have it. So there's maybe four minutes of indulgence that will serve us all well in case we need it. Um, some of you are, some of you humorously will remind me that Glengormley has a long history of people having cardiac moments during services. Um, and so I'd like to avoid that. But what the, so part of this is not the resource, just that, but it's just an important part to look after people when they're here. I think those are hopefully all of the housekeeping announcements. In Colossians 1, there is just this remarkable piece of scripture describing what Jesus does in the world. And in the message, uh, Eugene Peterson's paraphrase in modern English of Colossians 1, it says, we look at this son and see the God who cannot be seen. We look at the sun and see God's original purpose in everything created, for everything, absolutely everything, above and below, visible and invisible, rank after rank of angels, everything 
God started in him and finds its purpose in him. He was there before any of it came into existence and holds it together right up to this moment. And when it comes to the church, he organizes and holds it together like a head does a body. He was supreme in the beginning and leading the resurrection parade. He is supreme in the end. From beginning to end, he's there towering far above everything and everyone. So spacious is he, so roomy, that everything of God finds its proper place in him without crowding. Not only that, but all the broken and dislocated pieces of the universe, people and things, animals and atoms, get properly fixed and fit together in vibrant harmonies, all because of his death, his blood that poured down from the cross. It's incredible scripture, the idea that Jesus is supreme over everything else in the cosmos, and as well as that, Jesus is working in each of our lives. And I love how Eugene Peterson translates in modern language that idea of Jesus is putting everything back together. Because we know there's broken things, we know there's dislocated things, and people and things and atoms and all the way down. And Jesus' work in the world, the resurrection work, is putting creation back together again. This is the great news of God's work in the world that we live in. It's marvelous. And it inclines us to praise him and give thanks to him. And the band are leading us this morning. Because of those words that Reverend has just read, we can sing the words of this song. When all I see is the battle, you see the victory. When all I see is the mountain, you see the mountain move. Let's stand together and worship. When all I see is the battle, you see my victory. When all I see is the mountain, you see.
let's just stay standing and we're going to ask the boys and girls to come up. I know there's lots of them scattered around because they've been running around church all morning. So they are there. So, yep, here they come. If you want to hop on over to this mic. And we're going to hear you sing as well. Our kids' song today is I'm Going to Trust in God. I'm gonna trust in God, I'm gonna trust in Jesus without shame and without fear. I'm gonna fix my eyes on the hope of glory for his day is drawing me. Thank you, girls. I like your coordinated tops today, all in black. It was, don't think I was premeditated at all, but it, uh... let's pray together. <coughs> Father God, we thank you for your word to us. We thank you that when we look to Jesus, we see you revealed. You have told us everything that we need to know about you through your son, Jesus. And in Jesus, we see your original purpose in everything that you have made. We remind ourselves that everything got started in Jesus and find its purpose in Jesus. Father, we thank you as John describes it, that Jesus was with you in the very beginning and nothing was made that has been made without him. Father, we thank you that as God, you want us to know who you are. We thank you that it is Jesus who holds life together because life feels very hard to hold together. And so we confess this morning as we remind ourselves that all of this is in your hands. And you allow some things to be in our hands, but we are in your hands that ultimately you have all of us loving us and caring for us and drawing us closer and closer to you. We thank you that as God, there is no other God that even compares closely to you. A God of love and intention, a God of power and of care, a God who draws us closer and closer to you because you are trustworthy. <clears throat> we can trust you because you're dependable, because you are pure and holy. There is nothing bad about you. You are all good. We thank you that from beginning to end, you are there towering above everything and everyone, and that there is room for all of us in you, and that your plan for us is that we would be with you forever. 
as Colossians describes it, it is incredible to think that your action in the world is putting all the broken and dislocated pieces of the universe, people and things, animals and atoms, being fixed and fitted together in harmony because of Jesus. Father, we humbly ask that you would show us that in our lives today because we know that our lives are broken and dislocated, that the lives of those we love are broken and dislocated and that the world we live in is the same. And yet, Father, we remind ourselves of the deeper, wider and more vibrant truth that you are at work putting everything back together as it should be. Father, help us to do that in our worship today, in our praise, in our prayers, in our hearing from your word. That as we spend time in your presence together, that we would know your presence. That we would know your presence in our head and in our hearts and that we, we would yearn just for more of you in our lives. Bless us as we worship you, as you put us back together and each other back together and the world we live in is restored because of you. We pray all of this in Jesus' name. And the people of God said, Amen. 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 Boys and girls, if you'd like to go to Glue. We're going to have a song um, just in a moment, but as we do that, we're going to do something we haven't done in two and a half years. So in the service, we're going to collect the offering. We've been collecting the offering for two and a half years. It just hasn't been happening um, in the service. And so you may not be prepared for this at all. I'm aware that many people will give electronically or you would have given at the back at the end of the service, which is why I'm giving you a couple of seconds now just to gather your heads if you have anything to be collected. Um, but as we do that... Um, if you're a guest or a visitor, you don't need to give. This isn't like anything else. You don't need to give just because you're here. If you're a member here and you love Jesus, then we ask you to give as part of your service to Jesus. But if you're a guest or a visitor, there's no expectation of that at all. Um, but we're going to worship God, and as we do that, we're going to collect the offering. So the words of this next song are taken from Psalm 121, which is true whether you read it in Hebrew or English, whether you know it from the song in the hymn book, or whether you will know it from these new words. And the psalm says this. The tune's going to play while I read, just so you get familiar with the tune. I lift up my eyes to the hills. Where does my help come from? My help comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. He will not let your foot slip. He who watches over you will not slumber. Indeed, he who watches over, over Israel will neither slumber nor sleep. The Lord watches over you. The Lord is your shade at your right hand. The sun will not harm you by day, nor the moon by night. The Lord will keep you from all harm. He will watch over your life. The Lord will watch over your coming and going, both now and forevermore. What a great God.
lift my eyes and see I need not be Thank you. Richard is going to come and lead us in our prayers for others. As we come to this time of prayer in our service this morning, we're going to give thanks for what God has done for us and for what he means to us. And we will also be uh, asking for prayer for those in the persecuted church and uh, also for the con continued conflict between Ukraine and Russia. And uh, also then we will remember our own little province where we still have many problems to solve there as well. So we will pray for all these things. Let's go to prayer. Heavenly Father, as we gather together in your house this morning, we come with praise and thanksgiving, and all that we have cometh from you, Lord. Thank you for the cross, Lord. Through the blood you shed, our sins are forgiven, and we have eternal life. Thank you, Lord, for the privilege we have to come into your house to hear your word faithfully proclaimed. Lord, as we come here to hear your word, there are many things does not happen. We think of the persecuted church where your people can, can be beaten even to death just because they whisper your name. Father, we pray you will be with your people in the, in the persecuted church and from all who would harm them, that you, you, you would guide and protect them. Lord, we would continue to pray for the people in Ukraine by a war brought about by a dictator lusting for power that is costing many lives in both nations. 
Lord, we pray that this could cease and leaders come together to bring peace to all in these countries. There are many countries where violence and conflict arise. We pray that this too may come to an end and folk will be able to live together in peace. Lord, we bring our own province to you. Because of the political impasse that we have, Lord, many people are suffering in health and in poverty because of the problems arising within Europe and the United Kingdom. Lord, we thank you that they are taking part in talking, and we pray that through this there will be a solution can, that, can all, that all can embrace and we can become normal again. And now, to him who loves us and has freed us from our sins, by his blood, and has made us to be a kingdom and priests, to serve his God and Father, to him be glory and power for ever and ever. Amen. <clears throat> We're going to continue this morning in Esther chapter 4. So if you have a pew Bible, um, you feel free to look that up. It'll appear on the screen as we're reading it, but sometimes it's good to be able to, to, to look back at it. Um, or you can, maybe you've brought a Bible from home or it's on your phone. Um, but Esther chapter 4, and we'll read um, the, the whole chapter. When Mordecai learned of all that had been done, he tore his clothes, put on sackcloth and ashes, and went out into the city, wailing loudly and bitterly. But he went only as far as the king's gate, because no one clothed in sackcloth was allowed to enter it. In every province to which the edict and order of the king came, there was great mourning among the Jews, with fasting, weeping, and wailing. Many lay in sackcloth and ashes. When Esther's eunuchs and female attendants came and told her about Mordecai, she was in great distress. She sent clothes for him to put on instead of his sackcloth, but he would not accept them. Then Esther summoned Hathak, one of the king's eunuchs, assigned to her, and ordered him to find out what was troubling Mordecai and why. So Hathak went out to Mordecai in the open square of the city in front of the king's gate. Mordecai told him everything that had happened to him, including the exact amount of money Haman had promised to pay into the royal treasury for the destruction of the Jews. He also gave him a copy of the text of the edict for their annihilation, which had been published in Susa, to show to Esther and explain it to her. And he told him to instruct her to go into the king's presence to beg for mercy and plead with him for her people. Hathak went back and reported to Esther what Mordecai had said. Then he instructed him to say to Mordecai, All the king's officials and the people of the royal provinces know that for any man or woman who approaches the king in the inner court without being summoned, the king has but one law, that they be put to death unless the king extends the gold scepter to them and spares their lives. But thirty days have passed since I was called to go to the king. When Esther's words were reported to Mordecai, he sent back this answer. Do not think that because you're in the king's house, you alone of all the Jews will escape. For if you remain silent at this time, relief and deliverance for the Jews will arise from another place. But you and your father's family will perish. And who knows, but you may have come to your royal position for such a time as this. Then Esther sent this reply to Mordecai. Go, gather together all the Jews who are in Susa and fast for me. Do not eat or drink for three days, night or day. I and my attendants will fast as you do. When this is done, I will go to the king, even though, is it against, even though it is against the law. And if I perish, I perish. So Mordecai went away and carried out all of Esther's instructions. And our reading for this morning. So this is one of the big moments in the book. 
I have a t-shirt, or I had a t-shirt in the house that had this, one of the verses in this on the back of it. It's used regularly and often. And who knows that you have come to your royal position for such a time as this. It's, it's well known. But let me just remind you the verse that unlocks all of this. In Romans 8, And we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. And all that's happening in the story of Esther, and hopefully as you see the story of Esther, you're able to then apply somebody else's story into your life. You have this picture that God's working in all things for the good of those who love him. I don't believe God make, a good God makes bad things happen, but God works in all things for the good of those who love him. He is the good father. There's nothing bad in him or about him. He doesn't make or create evil, but he is so good that he can use all things and turn them for good. That's quite an incredible level of goodness about God. That even the bad things end up coming good over time. In chapter 3, Mordecai doesn't bow to Haman. Haman, in a great example of unrestrained and out of control anger, moves from Mordecai not bowing to the result that all Jews in the whole of the Persian Empire should be killed. And so as you come into chapter 4, Mordecai is in deep mourning. He tears his clothes. He wears sackcloth and ashes. He's wailing loudly and bitterly. This isn't discreet and unnoticed. This isn't the bowing incident where really Haman didn't notice and only a couple of royal officials noticed and they made a bit of a thing out of it. This is public and loud. In chapter 3, we hear that Susa is bewildered and now all the Jews across the empire are in mourning. Interestingly in the story, Esther's unaware of this. Everybody else is upset and in mourning and in grief and Esther, Esther doesn't know what's going on. She's in a part of the palace where this information hasn't reached she tries to bring Mordecai out of his grief and you have a scene that really shows the reality of grief which you know in your life can't be changed by somebody bringing you a spare set of clothes. It's like Mordecai's upset. Oh, here's a new jumper. You'll be fine. That's not how grief works. So Mordecai shares all the details with Esther's eunuch. It's not gossip. He tells the detailed truth. He puts it all there and he instructs Esther to go to the king to beg for mercy. And at this point, Compared to earlier in this story, she's unable to go to the king, possibly due to the king's fickleness. A major point of King Xerxes' life might be that after a month, he's already forgotten about his new queen. It's like he doesn't call for her. There's no day-to-day -day rhythm of their marriage being together as she is queen now. And to go there risks, when you go on invited, risks death. And to be fair to Esther, there is a chance of this because King Xerxes, based on our knowledge so far, is not a reliable figure. There is no guarantee he is as fickle as you could imagine, and there's a very genuine fear. There is invitation at the heart of chapter 4. Mordecai is clear with her. She may risk death going into the king's company, but if the law stands as it is, then she will die along with the Jews. And even if God acts to rescue the Jews, she will still die. Esther is in a tight invitation of what she does with her behavior, which leads us to the unmasking of all of the story until this point. And who knows that you have come to your royal position for such a time as this. I want to refer to this this morning as the invitation in the story. Esther's response is one of preparation and then action. Gather all the Jews in the city and fast, fast for me. There's still no mention of prayer. There's still no explicit, but it sort of hinges on the fasting. Some commentators would say, well, this is obviously where God's involved. But God's not in the story of Esther and certainly not named. I think God's all over it. If you apply Romans 8 to it, God is at work all the way through it. But it's just fasting. And Mordecai goes to mobilize the Jews. I want to do something slightly different this morning. I want to spend a lot longer trying to apply this into our lives and what might this mean for us today if we take Esther seriously as both a book of wisdom but further than that, a book where we can see in somebody else's story that God is moving in all things to do his work for those he loves. And hopefully as you see it in Esther's story, you're thinking about it in your story. And so for such a time as this, so Esther has an invitation brought to her. The invitation as it comes to her will challenge her comfort. You become aware that at this point in Esther's life, that's wonderfully faint on that screen there. Esther is in comfort. Esther's situation at this point, she has become queen. She is in the royal complex. She is not in any danger. Worst case, she'll be banished and live a life like Vashti in the, in the, in the, in the royal complex. 
Esther's invite to action is sacrificial. And Esther's action has the potential to be part of God's rescue plan. That's what happens at this point in this story. She is in a strange land. And who knows that you have come to your royal position for such a time as this. Esther is written at a time where all of the Jews are not where they're meant to be. They have all been carted off into a strange land. They are prisoners there, but they have settled there. In the fullness of the story, most of them don't go back home. We sort of miss that in the Old Testament. The history is a bit hard to see, but very few Jews actually go back to Jerusalem at the end. Jews resettled across the empire and stayed there. We often leave the detail of that out because there's the... There's the re-establishment of the city and even the re-establishment of the temple, but actually not all the Jews go home. They've been there for decades and generations, and actually their faith and practice in Judaism actually becomes a, a faith and practice that's outside the temple. But we live in a time when the world around us can seem very foreign to us. We're not living in the fullness of God's kingdom. Things as they are now in the world that we live in are not as they should be. The world can seem unfamiliar and strange. Don't misunderstand me. This isn't that we're going to go home and be somewhere else one day. I don't think that's what the Bible or what Jesus really speaks of. The end of the Bible in Revelation gives us a picture. We saw this when we read Immerse together. You have this picture of God remakes the earth and the holy city comes down on earth. And at the end of the Bible, the picture isn't that Christians are in heaven with God. The picture is that God is on earth with God's people. I will dwell with my people on earth with them. That's ultimately where the Bible talks of where we end up. But I think we can agree this morning that the world we live in is not as it should be. And in that point, we are the same as Esther, who's in the Persian court, and it's not as it should be. She's not where she wants to be. Our world is changing, and it changes again. Let me ask you this. Who has a smartphone, as in a phone with a screen that you touch? Just raise your hand. Put your hands down. I tried to explain to Lily McCormick how a landline used to work. <laughs> she could not understand. I was like, so in Granny's house, there was a phone in the hall, and you phoned, and somebody in the hall answered the phone. And she's like, why? And I was like, because that was the only phone. And she was like, she was so confused with just the idea of you had to be in and the person you were speaking to had to be in, in their house in order to have a conversation. And that's in our lifetime. Some of you have learned this. We learn all the time. We learn new things all the time. You don't all have smartphones, but most of us have the ability to have the internet or information on your phone. You have learned how that works. We are probably, unless the internet and the technology companies all crumble, we're probably not going back to landlines. You're not going back. It's really hard to explain it to somebody younger. Lily thinks I lived in biblical times. <laughs> it's like, what? I was like, yeah, I used to phone. I used to phone your mom, and she'd be in her house, and I'd be like, what? What happens if you're right? You just had to wait until somebody came back. <laughs> As a what I mean is the world we live in changes all the time, and we adapt all the time. We learn. Particularly in COVID, you learned how to do video calls or FaceTime calls. Or actually, you may not even know what they're called, but you could speak to family on video. You could speak to people on YouTube. You've watched services on YouTube. We've done things that you've never done before in the last number of years. Of all ages, we adapt, we learn. You can pay your bills on your phone. And that's without using them at a very high level. You've just learned how to do things. I name that because sometimes we believe that the past is going to come back again. We believe, oh, in the good old days, and we'll go back to those. The, the good old days aren't coming back. It just keeps moving forward. And we learn and we adapt. That's what happens in life. We're all learning. And possibly the youngest people in your family or friendship circle are the ones teaching you. There's times where Malachi is showing me how something works on an iPad, and I feel very old. And I'm pretty good with stuff. But we keep learning, and things keep moving. Esther and Mordecai are in Persia, and it's interesting in their telling of the story that they don't look back. Mordecai doesn't go, we're not doing any of this. We're going to wait and we'll go back to Jerusalem. It's not how Mordecai works. Esther becomes queen and there's no sense in Esther's story that she's going, okay, so if we get to go back to Jerusalem, I'm going to step down as queen or I'll become the queen in Jerusalem. There's no plan for this. They inhabit the world that they're in and move along in that world. 
To apply Esther in our lives, I think at some point, is to reflect on the question. And who knows that you're here for such a time as this? It's a strange land. It's a confusing land. Ultimately, it's not where we will be, but it's not what it was before. But if we take Romans 8 seriously to look at for such a time as this, then we do have to reflect on that God is working in all things for the good of those he loves. That every part of our lives has the potential to be something that God is using for our good and for the good of others. And then we see that working out when we apply what Mordecai says. So in your life, possibly, you are where you are for such a time as this. That's what's happening in each of our lives. That is the invitation, I think, if we apply Esther 4. There's an invitation brought to us in the circumstances that you're in. There is invitation. And then in the same way as it happens for Esther, the invitation will bring challenge to your comfort. And then hopefully, the next line, the blanks are for you to fill your own name in. So I would say Reuben has an invitation. The invitation will bring challenge to my comfort. Reuben is in comfort. Don't like that bit. You can tell that's going to change. Reuben's action is sacrificial. And Reuben's action is part of God's salvation rescue plan. If you're to inhabit the story of Esther and apply it to ourselves, at some point those are the questions you need to think about in your life. Because God has placed you in the world in this season. I think it's interesting that in 2023, in February, we're all in church together at this time. And some of you are really young, and some of you are not so young. And we're all here at this time. And if God is God, and God knows what he's doing, he has brought us here for this time. And some of us are young, and some of us are older, and some of us are in seasons of delight and joy, and some of you, your hearts are breaking. And for such a time as this, in God's plan, not my plan or your plan, in God's plan, this is where we are. You're not in the south coast of France. Sorry. This is where we are. And the invitation is to each of us. And that invitation will bring challenge to our comfort. The challenge of you are where you are for such a time as this. Then often it is true that we're in comfort. We're in a situation where in order to take action that will take us out of comfort and that will be sacrificial. And that action, if we believe Esther's story and believe Romans, is the actions that we take in our lives are significant and important, and God will use them to do his work in the world. What if God has placed you where you are so he can do good things through you and for others, and good things for you? If the family you have, which may not be the one you want, is the one that he placed you in. If your home location, where your house is, we're having this conversation about our street. So God's put us in 47 Dalewood for such a time as this. What does that mean for our neighbours? What does it mean for your neighbours that where you live, if God is involved in the world that we live in, then at some point, if we're applying Esther 4, we have to go, and I know, I know you're thinking, you haven't met my neighbours. I know that. For such a time as this. This is where we are. This is the place where we are. What if in your job, you're in that place and that role at this time for such a time as this? If we use Esther and Mordecai's example as a way to see our own story, because sometimes you can see the truth more easily in others. So you could see it in somebody else's story. You could say, possibly if it's somebody you know well, oh, I know what they should be doing for God right now. Well, don't get ahead of yourself. Just apply it to yourself just now. And think, where has God placed me now in this season? And possibly in Colossians 1 of Jesus putting everything back together again. And Romans 8, where God uses all things for good. Possibly in this season of life, there's things for you to be doing for God's kingdom. As followers of Jesus, people who have realized his love for us and responded in turn to Jesus out of his love for us by loving him, God takes your life and my life really seriously. Because he gave us life and allows us to be part of his work in the world. I think it's a really bad plan, to be honest, that God chooses to use human beings to do his work. Because I think I'm inherently unreliable. 
Some of you have asked me to do things a couple of weeks ago, and I still haven't done them. And somehow, God Almighty uses human beings to do his work in the world. That's how God chooses to work. He chooses to use us. He chooses to use you and I and other people who love Jesus to do his work. I realize this is deeply challenging. I'm just going to take you further. Because it also applies to us as a church. Who knows that we are here for such a time as this. As a church, we're in this place and in this time. It's not the past. You could argue it's a strange land. It's 2023. 2023, I think, is one of the years that was in Buck Rogers when I was a kid. And now I'm alive in it, which I find very confusing because whenever you're in the 80s, these were the far off things. We would all have flying cars and be living on Mars. And in fact, life looks kind of similar to how it did back then. But it's 2023, and this is our time. And sometimes we put those things off. We put off taking seriously what we should be doing in the here and now. We delay things and wait and have caution. But Esther tells us, for such a time as this, we are in a foreign land. It is different as it was before. But before wasn't perfect at all. The danger is we begin to look at the past and think, oh, back in the day. I, some of you have told me there was two services on a Sunday morning in Glengormley. There were chairs down the aisles and 350 in Sunday school. That is true. That is a fact of its time. I was 221 in Greenwell Street Youth Club. It was so big, I didn't go. It was huge. But the bit we don't say is, in Greenwell Street in 1986, there was nothing else to do. The town was locked. There was no takeaways, there was no cinemas, there was no other version of leisure or pleasure happening because we lived in a conflict zone and everybody went to church. We edit the past into a, the years of everyone coming to church have gone. That's not coming back. We're in a strange land, a different land. We're in the part of the city which is a graveyard for churches. Seven churches have closed. And that's in recent memory. That's in the last 30 years. George Muir, apologies George, I didn't ask you before this, but George has told me that in the late 70s in one of the churches he was in, it was beginning to decline then. Which puts us at 40 years of decline. Now that's happening across the island, it's happening across the Western world, it's happening because Christianity has blossomed since the 5th century on this island, and now we've reached a point where this is changing in the world that we live in. So it's not just about the here and now, it's long, long term. It goes back to St. Patrick and the land of saints and scholars and Irish Christians brought Christianity across Europe, but it's now 2023. We're in a different time. Somebody said to me, do we need to be here? Should the church not just sell Glengormley and Bally Henry and New Mosley or Mosley and then just all go to Carn Money? Now, I did well to keep my tongue in my head. <laughs> Doesn't always happen. But those are the thoughts that people are having, and we should be able to say them. But if we apply Esther 4 to a, such a time of this, that's a different thing. I do want to challenge this for a minute because churches have closed due to the city changing. And I've heard people say, not here, but just people saying they weren't our people. It's confusing to me that the Presbyterian Church does mission all over the world. And yet it struggles in a city to cross the street. For 50 years, the north of the island has not done mission to the whole community. In fact, we've got smaller in areas of the city that have changed. And yet, we profile churches in Dublin that are growing and they're ministering in a culture that is very strange and far more post-Christian than here. So I lived in Dublin for 11 years. You couldn't say Presbyterian because nobody knew what it was. 1.3% of the population were possibly close to Presbyterian. People just didn't know what you were talking about. You just said you were a Christian and you went to church. Because the word, what was that P word you just said? that You didn't understand it. But in our part of the city, we have a challenge. Because the city has changed and people sometimes go, but they're they're not ours. That's, 
That's a serious block where we deny for such a time as this. As a church family, we need to take seriously that we are here in the 21st century for such a time as this. But it does require us as a church family to prepare and act, because that's what Esther does. But the action comes very quickly. It's not preparing for long periods of time. So let me show you some direction, our hope and our prayers of what we would look like and work towards. Taking people to Jesus so they might fall in love with him and that those who love him might grow to love him more dearly, more deeply. That is a place, we'd be a place that loves Jesus and wants to bring people into relationships that they'll love Jesus because Jesus' love for us is the transforming love of our lives. That's very different to debating the woes of the world. They're just going to keep getting and going further. I had a minister tell me, an older minister, who went, I'm so glad I'm retiring. Oh my God, it's going to be so tough for you guys. I'm a little bit confused by that. But he's a 20th century minister in a 21st century world. And he just sees the world change around him and he goes, I don't understand this. And I'm thinking, I don't, what do you mean you don't understand it? It's just life. It's just the life that we live in. But he's going, but we need to go back to what it was before. How it was before is not coming back. The opportunity in this season for such a time as this is to go, what's really important? We want people to love Jesus with all of their lives. And we want people to, Jesus to, to know that Jesus loves them. And we bring people to Jesus. We have different ways of saying the same thing. Do you want people to follow Jesus with all of their life, for all of their life? I desperately see that. Let me give you three really easy things that I hope will appear on the next slide. In John 1, you really have the easiest version of mission that you can get, which essentially is come and see. That's what happens in John 1. People go, come and see. Jesus says, come and see, and the disciples begin to follow him. Then one of the disciples says to another disciple, come and see. Really, our job as a church is to say to the world outside, here, come and see. Come and see. We don't save people. We don't have the power to save people. You've been praying for some of the people that you love dearly that this would make sense to them for decades. But we do get to invite them. We do get to say, come and see. That's the invitation. Then you move into, Jesus says, be with me. It's the great claim of Christ. Be with me. John 15, abide with me. Remain in me. Be with me. Be branches on the vine and his lifeblood moves through us. It's the incredible good news of Christianity. Jesus says, just be with me. And at that point, we need to reflect on our church life and go, are we given opportunities for people to experience the presence of God? Is that what happens in our worship when you're here together? Is that the weight that we feel and the, and the addictive, I want to be here. I want to be in God's presence. I want to be with God's people gathering in worship and in prayer together because I want to be with Jesus. And then when you spend time in his presence, you become like who you spend time with. Which you see on the street when you see a bunch of teenage boys and they're all being silly because they become what they're, what they're like with. They become who they're with. But in Christianity, you spend time with Jesus and you begin to look like Jesus. Become like me, is what Jesus says. When you, love, when you realize that he loves you and he's done everything, he's died for you, he's brought you into his family, he has forgiven all of your sin, you want to be with him. Why would you not want to be with him? But when you're with him, you become like him. It's what happens when he is Lord of our lives. That's the invitation that comes. I name it as invitation because actually you're free to do it or not to do it. That's how this works. It's very similar to Esther. Mordecai goes, talk to the king. Don't talk to the king. He's really quite Jewish in his approach. He, if, the, if, the, if Esther had uh, extra bits in, it would have a shrug. The saving of the people depends on this. The genocide of the Jews across the Persian kingdom. And Mordecai's like, talk to them. Don't talk to them. God will do his work. You're, you can do this, you might die. You're probably going to die anyway. God's going to do what God's going to do. The invitation is there. I think if we are to apply this and take this seriously and not to get around it is to go for such a time as this. As individuals where we've been placed, as a church where we are. If you aren't a follower of Jesus this morning, 
I want to be clear with you, this is the agenda I have. I want you to see Jesus as clearly as I can make him. You'd be surprised sometimes how hard I have to work at that. It's, it, it just don't want to get in the way. I just want you to see Jesus because Jesus is the best person that you can ever see and the one person that you could devote your life to. And he won't let you down. But it's the same as a church family. This is what is important. When we gather, do we experience the presence of God? And when we spend time in God's presence, do we become like him? Yes, we do. And then we invite people to come and see. Give me two fingers. Just put your two fingers up. Okay. If you're a follower of Jesus, I want you to do this. Do you feel your heart beating? You're going, going, you're okay. If you're a follower of Jesus, do you feel your heart beating? You're commissioned as a worker in God's kingdom. You're alive. It can't depend on me. In fact, if it depends on me, we're all in trouble because there's one of me and I have limited time in the same way that you have limited time. But sometimes we think, oh, that's for other people. For such a time as this. If you are alive, then you are a worker in God's kingdom. Working to do the work that Jesus does in the world. So let me give you some ways that you might stop this because you'll have them in your head, but because you'll be polite, you might not say them directly to my face. This is the invitation. The first response is just no. And most of you have learned not to say that just as bluntly as that, but it is. Here's the invitation, no. Or my time is done. Something I've heard a huge amount is, I've tried that. We did that before. Or we tried that. Or we have done that. If you find yourself thinking any of those things, you're rejecting the invitation. That's what's happening. So at times whenever, for such a time as this, that you're called to be in a place, so you're at work tomorrow and you go, oh, maybe I could, and you go, no, or I spoke to them before, or anything comes in your head, you have to go, I'm rejecting the invitation. The invitation is to step into this for this time. Who knows that you've come to the position that you're in, in your life, living beside your neighbours, or in your job, or with your family as you've got older, or with your friends, who knows? But for such a time as this, that you're the person who's there. Not the person beside you, not the person behind you, you're there. I'm not there tomorrow morning. You're not where I am tomorrow morning or on Tuesday morning or this week. You're there. Who knows for such a time as this? That's why God put you there. But for us as a church, we are here. And we are here for such a time as this. You were here Monday night for the child protection training. And the lady at the front stood up as she was beginning and she goes to Newington and she said, there's 15 people in my church. And there's four in the GB. I thought, there it is. Some of you are here today and you were in Dunlop. Dunlop no longer exists. Seven churches have closed in the presbytery. It is coming to the Western world as secularism and demographics happen. That is happening across the board. It's not just Presbyterianism. But we are here for such a time as this. This is the time, it is not the past. And in good news, it's not what's coming in 50 years time. So the only good news about the world is it's only going to get more crazy. Which is what I tell my colleagues when they get panicked about the state of the world today. I went, oh, could you imagine 20 years time? You think identity's complex now? Can you imagine what it's going to look like in another 20 years for your grandchildren or your great grandchildren? How complex the world will be. How crazy Christians will sound when they say they worship Jesus in 50 years' time. People go, that we'll probably all have our own gods on our headsets. Who knows what the big tech giants will make for us. This is the time. Be glad that it's not the time ahead. It's only going to get more complex. And God will bring people to that point and use them to do his work in the world in that time. My job here is to teach the Bible and invite you to come and see. That's what happens. Come and see Jesus. And apply Esther 4 in your life. It's then to invite you to be in his presence. It's incredibly important that we're at worship. It's incredibly important that we're praying together. But as we pray, we're praying in his presence. We're praying for God's spirit to move on us and on us as a church. Because if people outside of church are to come to faith in church, it will require more prayer than we've ever prayed before. Because God comes when he's wanted. And we're asking God to move. 
Because when I think of the people in my life who don't yet know Jesus, it will take God to move for them to come here, for this to make sense in their world. That will require us humbling ourselves to do that. I would love us to develop prayer ministry so people can receive prayer after church, but I would love us to develop an ongoing living prayer ministry across us as a church. And often that's not what happens when we pray. But when you read Acts, people wanted to be in the room because the Holy Spirit moved in the room and they wanted to be in the presence of God. If that's something you're interested in, I'd love you to chat to me. If you're going, I want to be involved in prayer ministry where we're seeking after the Holy Spirit. We have no time to be hanging around. There's no time for delay. We need to develop a really good children's ministry and youth ministry. So we have about 10 young people connected to us. And they're connected to us because they're not here. They're here at bits and pieces. And it grieves their parents and it grieves other people in the church. We need people who are committed to our young people long term and going, we're going to do this. If that's something you're interested in, speak to me after the service. I'm going to bring things to you and I'm going to invite you to do things because that's my job to do this. And I'm going to use the shorthand of saying for such a time as this. And you can say no. You can say you don't want to. That's fine. We have youth leaders at the minute who are doing stuff and they're going, we don't really want to do this. But they, know, they see the need for it. But the hope is that as you spend time in the Holy Spirit, you're going, oh no, I want to do this. I desperately want to do this. We want to see this happening in this place. We are in a part of the city with 12 schools near us. 12, I googled it yesterday because I kept thinking them up and getting confused. 12 schools in the neighborhood. The kids aren't in church. They're not here. If we had 1 or 2% of school children coming here, we would need to build. We'd probably need to take over Tim Hortons and all the houses to this side to build something. There are thousands of kids around us, thousands of young families around us. Come and see. I've been with you for two and three quarter years which on one level is nothing, and on one level, through COVID, it feels like I've been here about 15. We have two answers to that. Does it feels, I, feel, I, feel, I can't remember anything pre-COVID. Maybe you can, I can't. It all feels like a blur in my life before COVID. So it feels really short and it feels really long. But this is the clear direction of my calling with you. I'm hoping it's also your calling. I'm hoping as you sit there, you go, this is where we need to be going. If it's not, we need to be really honest and you just need to tell me. Because I'm going to break your hearts and you're going to break mine. Because I'm going to keep going in this direction and you're going to go, I wish you'd stop and just let us be on our own. Which is, I'll break your heart and you'll break mine. That's not trying to be rude or controversial. But it is saying, this is the weight of what God has brought to us for such a time as this. And we prepare and then we take action. That's what happens in Esther. This is the great invitation of life with Jesus. In Esther, there's this moment of risk because love involves risk. She gets the people to fast, probably to fast and pray, to prepare and then act. Because love involves sacrifice. And you know that. Because the people you love, you sacrifice for them. You give them time. You invest in relationship. That's what happens when you have love. And if we love Jesus, then we sacrifice with our lives. We sacrifice with our time, our treasure and our talents in order to do the work that he has called us to. But we do that because the one who loves us did that for us. So when I speak of sacrifice, and we all have a bit where you go, oh, I don't really. Put your hand up if you want sacrifice. Nobody's putting their hand up because you want sacrifice. But that's why we spend time in his presence, because we spend time in his presence and we are reminded that he is the sacrifice. That Christ gave everything for us. His time He left heaven and walked around for 30 years. That's a whole different level of constriction and sacrifice in his physicality. His talent, he gave his entire being for us. And the treasure, he is the treasure. He gave everything for us. And as a response to that, then we take seriously for such a time as this. Let's pray together. Father God, you love us and you work in our lives to do your work because your work is better than our work. 
And it is a beautiful thing that you would use us to do your work because you love us so much. For such a time as this, Father, if you're moving in our heads and in our hearts and in our lives, Father, we humbly pray that we would see you clearly and that you would use us to do your work both in our individual lives where you've placed us to be later today and this week, but where you've placed us to be as a church family. That we would be people who love you with our lives. And in turn, we would say to people, come and see. But as we are with you, that we would be with you. And that you would work on us so that we would become like you. Come, Holy Spirit, come. Amen.
Jesus, we turn our eyes to you. I thank Al and the band and George and Peter Shepherd and David and also glue leaders and those on tea and coffee and those who are unwelcome for enabling a Sunday morning to happen. Tonight for such a time as this we're going to gather for prayer at half past six and gather for Alpha at half past six for such a time as this. Um, let's say the grace to one another. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore. Amen. Amen.